We want to welcome you to today's broadcast. My goodness, we're looking forward to having a wonderful time as we lean in around God's Word. Well, today we are so elated to have with us as our guest speaker, all the way, all the way from downtown Toronto, Canada. <laughs> Amen. Uh, from, from the wonderful ministry, First Baptist Church Toronto, which has been in our city for over 194 years. And I thought it so welcoming that we would have uh, this, my friend, be able to communicate the grace of God to us on the subject matter that we've entitled for these next few weeks, the past, the present, and the future, as we lean in and look at the subject of black history. We understand that our history is not just about what is behind us, but it's also history is being made today and also in our future. Do you, you do remember that today is yesterday's tomorrow? So we are locking in uh, in the reality that as Jesus is the Alpha and the Omega, and we are allowing, we see that why we are in this present moment, we get the opportunity to live in the reality of who he is. So I am delighted to have him be able to come to us today. For some of you, you've met him a number of years ago. He was with us uh, at uh, Gateway City Church, but for some of you, this is the first time that you're going to be hearing him. And uh, Reverend Wendell Gibbs, he is a naturalized Canadian citizen by way of being initially born in Trinidad, Tobago. Yes, for all the Trinis, I know you're, you're glad to hear that. And he is an ordained minister with the Canadian Baptist Ontario and Quebec, and he holds his Masters of Divinity from Tyndale, come on, all you Tyndale folks that are that are have some of you who've graduated and those of you who are about to graduate. So this is an alumni here, and he also is a volunteer chaplain with the Toronto Police Services, and he's been functioning in this capacity for numerous years, serving our city, serving our police force in the area of giving counsel and care. But he's also, uh, one of the key things that he has been doing for a number of years is that with being a board member with the CLN, which is a, a, a group primarily focused towards the African Canadian community and ministers. He also serves as a board for, been on Mission GTA, been with uh, a board member of Jesus in the city. There isn't too much that this man of God has not been doing in this city and in this nation. And, for, and we are elated. We are honored to have him with us today. So I want you to put your blessed hands together because one of the greatest things that he truly ascribes to is that he's been married to his wonderful wife, Roselle, uh, and has two children, uh, Brandon and Brittany. And we are delighted to have him there today. So put your blessed hands together and let's welcome Reverend Wendell Gibbs as he comes to minister to us on this subject matter of the past, the present, and the future. God bless you. Greetings and thank you so much, uh, Reverend Roger Gushway. Uh, we certainly go back in the past. I think it was in the 1990s when we first met and glad to be with you all again in the ministry at, uh, at Kingdom Gate Equipping Center. I'm so glad to join you today, and I'm not sure who he was talking about just now. I just want to be a humble servant before the Lord, just to maybe just give you a few uh, spiritual truths to help you on this, on this day of uh, Black History Service and this month that we're celebrating as well. And we're just going to go and talk a little bit about what that means and the journey that we've been on here at First Baptist Church in particular. Uh, we were birthed in 1826. That's long before slavery was abolished. 
But we celebrate so much of, the, of our current uh, history, and we forget about the reality that Jesus has more history. In fact, God has the oldest history you would ever think about. And you go back in the Garden of Eden, and you'll recognize that God created first and foremost, he created humanity. And he created Adama, or the Hebrew word is man. He created man in his image. We'll come back to that later on. But God created Adam, the first Adam he created in a physical sense, and he made him in his image. And we're looking at the past, the present, and the future, how it relates to us as a people group, in particular the black community, and where we've all come from. We recognize that I'm from the Caribbean, some of you were born in Canada, we have a very heavy Nova Scotian influence at our church in particular because of the Underground Railroad, and that's how our church was birthed as well. So when we look at the past and when we look at the present, how do we navigate through all of this in looking forward to the future of what God has planned for our community? And I'm not sure uh, where you are, but this particular year has gone by. And last year, with the uprising, with the George Floyd murder and the many others, we saw the protesting across every state in the U.S. Never before in the history of the world have we observed a cry for true freedom for what we're looking for. And we recognize the past has always been underpinned with this racial divide. Not just because of blacks, but because I would suggest to you, because of sin. Well, let's go there. Because you can't talk about the past, and you can't talk about the present, and you can't talk about the future, unless you talk about the underlying factor that has enslaved so many, in particular, our black community. And when we talk about Black History Month, which was just, you know, evolved in the 1990s, thank God for Jean Augustine and for the effects of Ontario Black History Society in giving us a month, you may ask me the question, and I've asked it before, why one month? Why not the whole year? And then my Caucasian counterparts got jealous, and then I said to them, well, think about this. You've had 11 months all of your life to celebrate White History Month. Ah, how about that, huh? So we always, but we always tag it somehow to slavery, don't we? Black History Month seems to always tag because the history books have lied to us and don't give us some of the facts that we need to know about our past so we can live in the present and prepare for the future. Do you actually know some of your history? Because we tend to always use this month only to remind us of the contributions we have made as a people group across the world. In fact, just a couple Sundays ago, I had an ironing board, and I had an iron, and I was sharing in my message, and we, we learned that Sarah Boone was the, a black woman who invented the ironing board and the iron. Of course, we know Elijah McCoy, uh, with the real McCoy's call, who, who invented the lubrication system for the railway and steam engines. In, uh, that was in 1872. Sarah was in 1892. So we can look back, and we can talk about the wonderful contributions we've made, but much more than that, what was God doing in all of this design why we ended up being enslaved for 400 years all the way back to the 1600s and I've been to Africa a couple of times I've been there in the past watched and gone to Elmina Castle in, in, the, in the Ivory Coast and I've witnessed and seen from my very own eyes the atrocities that took place against our people but you've got to go back to the Garden of Eden because when God created Adam in his image God created a human race without divide and racial prejudices Something happened, though, and there was a story that you will learn that, 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 that Satan came in the midst of all of this and confounded God's plan for his human promise of unity with the Father. In fact, God came down in the cool of the day in Genesis 3, verses 8, and what did he do? He fellowshiped with his creation. But when Adam sinned, the physical human Adam sinned, he gave up his right for equality with God. Hmm. He sure did. He succumbed himself now to the temptations and Satan's woes of this world that brought on sin that now start to compare life to what it is. And it's that comparison that's bringing us to our judgment today when we see racial divide and we see ethnicity divides and we see black and color divides because sin brought comparison. In fact, the comparison was so bad that you saw the first murder was with his very own children, comparing their status in life, comparing their successes in their careers. In that past then, we were all lifted because we've all gone through the similarities of comparing our past sometimes, looking back and recognizing that we have failed many times in our past, haven't we? And we too have fallen short of God's glory time and time again. 
And in the book of Acts, chapter 7, verse 26, I want to just focus on that for just a moment. And I want to lead us somewhere because I want to suggest to you that every one of us is still enslaved today. And I want to leave you with that thought at the end that, I, that God wants you to still remain a slave. But we'll see what that means for us in this past, present, future. Because our future is to be enslaved. And we're living in the present right now in a physical world where we are still seeing an enslavement. Mm. And the theme verse is Acts 17 verse 26. But you've got to see what Paul was doing in the book of Acts through the whole process there. And he says, people of Athens, this is from verse 22. I see that in every way you are very religious. Sounds like our present world today. Because the past has always been shaped on religion. For as I walked around and looked carefully at your objects of worship. <laughs> uh, Pastor Roger and I was just talking earlier about the whole idea of, you know, I'm Baptist and he's got his own Christian fellowship and we've got Pentecostals on the left side and we've got Anglicans on the right and we've got Catholics down the middle and, ah, boy, I tell you, it's a good thing that Jesus was Catholic. Oh, no, I think he was actually Baptist. Yeah, I did some research. In fact, in our church, we've got a white Jesus picture in Gethsemane in the front, and we've got a black Jesus, the, the Messiah of Jesus being uh, ascended, that was uh, painted in 1954, at the back of our church. And I've always said since I came here, why don't we have a Chinese Jesus in the middle? In fact, if God made us in his image, can I suggest to you, regardless to what mankind has said, I want to suggest then Jesus potentially is also black. I don't mean black in terms of being exocentric towards your own cause. I'm talking about being in the image of God just the way he placed you. Because God judges the inside, not the outside. But we're going to get back there in a moment. I want to finish reading the passage. For I, as I walked around and looked carefully at your objects of worship, I even found an altar with the inscription to an unknown God. <laughs> so you are... Ignorant of the very thing you worship. You don't even know who this God is who made you in his image. And this is what I'm going to proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live. Uh, sorry, the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples built by human hands. Sound like Hebrews to me. And he is not served by human hands as if he needed anything. Rather, he himself gives everyone life and breath and everything else. And here's the key verse. Now, I'm reading in the NIV. The NIV says, from one man, he made all nations. The Passion says this, from one man, Adam, he made every man and woman and every race of humanity. But here's what the King James says in the original context. And hath made of one blood. Wow. Wow. Mankind has done what? We have transposed the profound origination of God's plan for all of humanity when we all have the same color blood and we are equal in God's eyes. And we took on the outside and start comparing ourselves and start dividing colors and nations and cultures. Wow. Yet in the original, God was talking about blood he says, and hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on the face of the earth and hath determined the times be before appointed and the bounds of their habitation. Well, we have to explain what that means in context of the past, the present, and the future. The earth is probably, as it was formed by God in Genesis chapter 1, about maybe 7,000 years old, I assume, 2,000 years ago, we said Christ showed up and he divided time, A A.D. and B.C. The only person in creation to split time was Jesus. Both past, present, future. The same yesterday, today, and forevermore. That's my Jesus, Yeshua HaMashiach, I'm talking about. And in this context, Jesus does what? In the story of Adam in that creation, where the earth is about 7,000 years old, that's the past we can relate to in our origination of this first creation that sinned. 
And somewhere along the Genesis story, you will see how man was trying to navigate the understanding of this higher supreme being who gave life to them, and they were sinning continually. And in fact, in Genesis chapter 11, God called Noah because of the sin that was perpetrated from this one Adam, and God called Noah to rec recreate an opportunity for his creation to follow in his commands. And you'll see right there in that creative story that Noah and his family replenished the earth from the flood. And it was in chapters 11 and 12, you will see that they tried to make a name for themselves again. Man, we are people of habits. Because God destroyed the earth with water because of sin. He gave Noah an opportunity with his family to recreate the earth. They replenish the earth, and what does the people do? They follow with the same pattern of sin. Why? Because I want to suggest to you, the second Adam hadn't come yet. Are you hearing me? The second Adam is about to come. But let's continue on, because Noah, in that story, they wanted to make a name for themselves. So what does God do? He confounds their language. He confounds their language and causes them to do what? To divide, to scatter. That's what the verse says in Acts 17, verses 26. In fact, there's many other cross-references that we're going to get to in a while. But in that reference there, determine the times before appointed and the bounds of their inhabitation. The NIV says uh, to inhabit the whole earth, and he marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of their lands. That means we were a part of that history of God's plan. I know we weren't there seven, six, five, four, three, two thousand years ago, but we were in God's plan and design because God is infinite in his grace and mercy and his creative power. And even though you weren't birthed thousands of years later, God was already on your mind because God shaped you in your mother's womb even before you were born. And so we are in the same light today of understanding. And if I can, can, can convince you of that divide, it's when God, because we heard the story of the curse that God put on Ham and black people came from that curse and all this rhetoric you hear going on. Where is your common sense, folks? Are you telling me that, that, that the sons of Noah, one was Chinese, one was white, and one was black? Are you telling me that Noah's offsprings somehow in their gene makeup were different? I want to suggest no. I want to suggest that God in his providence, who created this verse that affirms what happened in that story, affirms that as he scattered in various regions and spark the environment, God's, God's creative national culture within the people groups that moved into different areas is what shaped over years and years and generations and generations. I want to suggest to you, if you live in the Caribbean, in Trinidad or Jamaica, all of your life, and your offspring, your offspring, and you go to four generations later, I don't care how white you might be, I want to suggest that sun is going to have an effect on your pigment over time. If you live in Alaska, surrounded by snow all of your life, and you have offsprings, generations and generations and generations later on, I want to suggest that that environment is probably going to affect your pigment as well. And all that's happening is the environment is affecting our outside. But the King James says the blood the blood is going to remain the same. And when I cut that blood of yours, it's the same color, red or yellow, black or white, brown, doesn't matter. We bleed the same. So the first Adam, I want to read 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 44 to 47. Is there a natural body? There is also a spiritual body. So it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam. Adam, a life-giving spirit. Now I'm coming to the present. And I can't tell you too much more about the past in reference to us as a people, how we evolved. But all I know is this. We were there from the beginning. We were there in the creative story. In fact, if you study history, you will know Iraq was kind of the centerpiece for all of God's creation. It's, pro it's probably where most of the stories happen in Genesis. In fact, you will see the Garden of Eden was in that region. 
You will see the Noah's Ark was in that region. You will see all the stories that are aligned in the, in the Old Testament was in that region of Mesopotamia, if you want to call it that. It's when God scattered that they went west towards Israel, and that's where the story picks up because God called Abraham to leave the Ur of the Chaldees, which was east of that region, and head towards where? Where the promised land was going to be because God was, was fed up of the sin, and God was going to create a people for himself that was going to become the model for the world. This is generations later. Is it possible that some of these very same people in that Egyptian, Ethiopian, Northern African region that we have denied history forever, is it possible that we were a part of that story? <laughs> Is it possible that we were hewn to be the leaders and the Israelites that God would have called us to be? Now, don't get me wrong. Pastor Roger will probably correct me if I'm wrong. I'm not talking about esocentrism and trying to make us look like black, is pow black power is better. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the truth of the matter that the history books does not show that we were all equal in God's creative story from the past, in the present, and in the future. What happened is man, in his decisive, decisive sinful nature, is the one who, conf who confused God's plan and stifled a people group that's called the African diaspora. We have been fighting for days. Why? Because our color was different than the rest. I'm not sure when it evolved, but I'm telling you right now, I'm proud to be a black man. Why? Because every color comes from black. Did you hear me? You mix the colors and you'll see red, blue, yellow, green. You mix them all. And what would you get? You get black. And when, we, when they came to the Africas in the 400 years ago, why did they come? They came because we were strong. They came because we were tolerant to the environment. They came because we were hard-working people. We already had a city. We already had kingdoms. We already had palaces. I'm telling you right now, the history books does not align itself to what the truth is, but common sense tells you that we were the one that also was equal. It's God's creation. That was God's plan in the past. That's his plan today in the present, and that's God's plan for your future. Well, let's talk about the present then, because the present is not just about the Adam who became a living being. It's about the second Adam who became a life-giving spirit. And Titus chapter 3, verses 3 to 5 says this, At one time we too were foolish, disobedient, deceived, and enslaved by all kinds of passions and pleasures. We lived in malice and envy, being hated, being hated and, and, and hating one another. But when the kindness and the love of our Savior appeared, he saved us, not because of righteous things we have done, but because of his mercy, he saved us through the washing of rebirth and the renewal of our Holy Spirit. So let me talk about the present now. The present is this. At First Baptist Church, for example, you just heard we are 195 years old, birth before slavery was abolished. And we'll talk about it later on between a little engagement between Pastor Roger and I. But I want to suggest to you we were birthed out of racial tension because we were called a colored church in 1826, right up until we were birthed in 1941 where we found our new facility where St. Michael's Hospital is. Imagine we were called a colored church because 12 runaway slaves came to New France to escape from slavery in Virginia and started their first Baptist church and weren't allowed to be amongst other Caucasian churches. And that present reality is where we are today. And it's because of the faithfulness of great men who, regardless of their color, saw the gospel story of righteousness for all of humanity, they, were, they became embraced by all this who were there as well. This Jesus then shows up. This second Adam shows up. As you saw in 1 Corinthians chapter 5 verses 4 to four, uh, verses 5, sorry, 1 Corinthians 15 verses 44 to 47. But let me go back for a second right now. Genesis 2:7 says this. Genesis 2:7 and the Lord God formed man out of the dust Adam and of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living soul. That's the first Adam. But the second Adam in 1 Corinthians that you read earlier on, he became a what? He became a life-giving spirit. The first Adam had to be tempted to ensure that he was going to be aligned to God's fellowship with him in unity to God's creative power for eternity. 
And that test he failed. And we are going through a test every day, folks. You are tested every day based on your faith and your trust in God Almighty. And that test, you have to make a decision. The first Adam failed. And he was tempted, if you read the story in Genesis chapter 3, by three things. And one day I'll ask Pastor Roger to have me come back and talk about money, sex, and power. That the same three temptations Adam faced, it's the same three temptations Jesus faced in Matthew chapter 4. We won't go there, but Jesus, who was tempted with the same way, the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. That 2 Corinthians, uh, 2 John, chapters, 1 John, sorry, 2.15 talks about. And you will see there that Jesus, unlike Adam, did not give in to Satan's temptation. And that's why he's a life-giving spirit. Even though he's incarnate, showed up as man who was God. Birth by the virgin birth to, il to elude him from the man, female, sin nature. God impregnated a woman himself to shield Jesus from the sinful nature where he will become the Lamb of God. That takes away the sin of the world. In our present day, and in this Black History Month, you know, the church itself is arising up and in this protesting season to stand strong against all that we're seeing that's been going on. And I'll tell you, we're leading up to where we are present day, but it, it ain't too far away. The civil rights movement and even slavery and the adoption and the abolition of it in 1833, and then the civil rights movement in the 60s is only a few years away ago. A few years ago makes it very present that we have struggled as a people for this equality where we were there. We were there in Iraq. We were there in Mesopotamia. We were there in Israel. We were there in Egypt where there's no facts or story where Jesus would have grown up as a teenager before he became a 30-year-old man for his ministry back in Israel. We were all there, folks. All people were there. And so was all of God's creation. Every tribe, every town, every language, as we heard from Genesis chapter 11. We were all there. And this Jesus shows up in the New Testament. Ah, and he does something remarkable. He breaks the curse. However you want to interpret that. He breaks the curse from this comparison, from this hate and racial divide, because he came unto his own, and his own received him not. Jesus himself was racially profiled by his very own Israel Jewish followers. You and I have faced the same thing every day just by the appearance. 1 Samuel verse 16 and 7 says this, But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not look on his appearance or on the height of his stature, because I have rejected him. Why? Because Saul was not the one God wanted. Hallelujah, somebody. It was not Saul. It's not how you look on the outside. It's the favor of God that's happening on the inside that makes you a woman and a man of God. And it's not the outside, I have rejected him, for the Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. And this Jesus, who was racially profiled when he came on this earth, judged for who he was as an Israelite, showed up in places you would never think. The Pharisees, the Sadducees, the high priests rejected every notion that Jesus can hang with sinners. That Jesus can hang with prostitutes. That Jesus can go to Republicans. That Jesus can go to the well where Samaritans never talk to Jews and talk to a woman of all things and a Samaritan. Come on, somebody with me now. We are living in a racially divided world. But what is our story in this present day when Martin Luther King gave his life of peace to bring unity to all of God's creation? That's the big story there. The story wasn't so much that he was trying to become better than. And that's why Black Lives Matter is confusing because it's not just Black Lives Matter. It's Black Lives Matter also. You've got to put the A and you don't follow the organization. Follow the principle. Black Lives Matter also because we want to be equal, not better than, not superior than. We don't have to prove anything. We just want to let the world know that we are God's creation in his image. And by chance, Jesus is black also, did you get that? 
And he's also Chinese. And he's also white. And he's also brown. Because Jesus came for whosoever loves him. And he came to all peoples. So then, this present day, we are still living in this mentality of slavery. Let me speak to you as our people now. How are we going to be set free when we are training our young boys and girls and we're living in a culture that we even have to look like we have to make an excuse for our culture, excuse for our color? Always look like we have to, you know, satisfy somebody else to allow us to live our lives. And that's the mentality that we've been raised coming out of Africa. You think about the diaspora, and if you know the story there as well, more than 12 million died in the passageway. More than 12 million. I want to suggest it's over 20 million because it says it ranges from 12 million to 150 million that was transported from the Africas. Irregardless, folks, it was a sin of atrocity. And I want to read you a story because we're talking about Black History Month and the reason why we are so important now is because of slavery, really. Slavery has driven us to where we are, where there is a sense of superiority over a people's group. You don't have to succumb to that, though, because you are not going to find out very shortly in the future God has planned for us. All of us are equals in God's eyes. God doesn't judge us based on where we've come from, what color we are. What our status in life is, as I read to you earlier on, God judges from the inside of your heart. You know, but I could, I could pause for a moment here and give you a quick little uh, lesson for ourselves. Within our black community, we are sometimes the most racial, the most hateful. And that's not the gospel of Jesus Christ. You see, I'm a minister, I'm a father, I'm a husband, I'm a black man. And I'll tell you my story later on when I'm sitting down with Pastor Roger for a quick little uh, follow-up conversation. But I'm telling you first, when I became a follower of Christ in 1983, I first and foremost is a follower and a Christian first before I'm a black man. And I've got to learn the strategy and what that means so I can know how I can overcome. Because if I live in my blackness, I'm succumbing myself to what the expectations are from the superiors. But when I realize that I'm a king's kid, and I have equal authority and equal opportunity to rise above what the stigmas might be, then I can perhaps make a difference in my life and the lives I will impact as well. And that's the message I want to share with you today. Don't dwell in the past. Learn from the past. Don't, don't, don't dwindle too much in the present where you don't prepare for the future. That means you've got to get your mindset, your spirit, and your whole being in tune to what God has planned for us. Let me give you some more passages here as we now lead to where the future is. Isaiah 43 verse 18 to 19 says this, Forget the former things, do not dwell on the past. See, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs up, do you perceive it? I am making a way in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland. And this echoes what Philippians 3 verses 12 to 14 says. This is the old to the new. Now that I have already obtained all of this, Paul says this, or have already arrived at my goal, I press on to take hold of that which Christ Jesus took a hold of me. I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. But one thing I do know, Paul says, forgetting what is behind I am straining, I am pressing, I am moving forward to what is ahead. I press on towards the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward. And that is the ultimate goal, folks, because every one of us will die one day. You will die whether you're black, whether you're white, whether you're rich, whether you're poor. That's just temporal on this earth. This Adam that sinned, the first Adam who sinned, one of his curse was he was going to die. The second Adam that came and became the sacrificial lamb. The first Adam had to sacrifice lambs for atonement. The second Adam sacrificed himself for all of our atonement. And the second Adam resurrected with eternal power that now we have equally in his resurrection power, eternal life promised to you and I. And how does that relate to us today? Well, Galatians 3, verse 24 and 28, that the world is learning now. Because I'll tell you, in the 60s with Martin Luther King, in his plight for freedom, who was marching with him? Primarily blacks. 
maybe a few whites here and there, maybe a few browns here and there, but as you, if, you, if you look back and you will see, in the 60s, in the, in the plight, and Martin Luther King Jr., you know, he had a dream, and he sure did, and he spoke in Washington there in 1963, back on April the 4th, the best speech you will ever hear, where he gave his speech to declare to all of us and to declare to you as well and to declare to the world, I have a dream. It was a public speech that was delivered by American civil rights. And during that march in Washington, he delivered this to 250,000 civil rights supporters. There in Lincoln Memorial. It wouldn't take long years later, back in Memphis, Tennessee, what happens? But I'll tell you what he said. He says, I have a dream that one day, one day, black boys and black girls, white boys and white girls, in fact, all of God's creation, will walk hand in hand and will shout, free at last, free at last, thank God Almighty, I am free at last. And if you want to be free then, Let's go to where Genesis chapters 15 verse 13 declares this. We weren't the first ones enslaved. In fact, the word slave you will not find in the Bible. The Hebrew word for enslavement is Abba. Abba is the Hebrew word that means service or servant. In Genesis 15 verse 13, you'll find it there. And this is interesting because Adam started off with sin. Noah's family started off with sin. The world is living in sin today. And this is what it says. Then the Lord said to Abraham, you can be sure that your descendants will be strangers in a foreign land where they will be oppressed as slaves for 400 years. Isn't that interesting? We were enslaved for 400 years. It's like a, a, a foreshadow and a prophetic word of what was said to, the, to Abram, to, his, to the people of Israel, that's been done to us as well. Isn't that interesting? So we weren't the only ones enslaved, the black people I'm talking about. In fact, human trafficking is a reality to this very day. And there's hundreds of countries who are still practicing human trafficking and enslavement. And that's for another day altogether. And I can tell you who the countries are, by the way. But we won't go there. But slavery hasn't gone away. There was another type battling for our souls, though. Because slavery is a man-made term to do what? To own or to become, to have someone become the property of. God in the Old Testament meant slavery, or in this case, Abba, for what? Habad, sorry is the word, Habad. God meant for what? So that if someone couldn't afford to live a comfortable lifestyle, they can entrust themselves with a family and serve that family for their well-being. It had nothing to do with ownership and property. And in fact, they were to be released from that ownership, or I should say servanthood, if they had the means to do so. So we took, mankind took in this comparative in black and white that you see over the history. And what we did, we create an opportunity to enslave a people group just because of the way they looked. And today, we are in a battle. Folks, we're in a battle from two perspectives. We're in a battle for still in the civil rights movement, still fighting for our freedoms. Here's the difference. And I want to give you hope for your future. Unlike the civil rights movement in the 60s, what did you see last year when George Floyd was murdered? There was a knee on the neck. And I know you're upset and you want to say, take your knees off my neck. But I want to suggest what we should be saying as people of God is I want to say, you take your knees and join my knees as we kneel in prayer before Almighty God. Let this knee become knees of prayer before God for unity in God's kingdom. And this battle for our souls and this battle for equality and this battle for what's happening is not just our fight. The weapons of our warfare, they are not carnal, but they are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. And that's what was declared to me in this passage of, uh, of Corinthians. And I want to let you know, we are in a battle of our souls. Not a battle for your blackness or your culture. We're in a battle for our souls. Let me wrap it up for you if I can in this perspective. Because the battle I'm talking about is the battle waging in the war on slavery, which is the conflict between sin and righteousness. Sin 
unrighteousness. And I want to read you a profound passage of Scripture in compared to Genesis chapter 15, verse 13. This is what it says here in Romans chapter 6. And I'll read from verse 15. And I got one last passage to read for you in Revelations. What then in verse 15? Shall we sin because we are not under the law, but under grace? By no means. Now remember, Israel was going to be enslaved, as you saw, with Nebuchadnezzar and with Darius, with the Medes, the Persians, the Greeks, the Romans. They were always enslaved. In fact, 40 years, they had to walk in the wilderness, escaping Egypt and slavery there as well. So ongoingly, they experienced the same thing because of sin. Now, I'm not suggesting that we were enslaved because of sin. We were enslaved because of somebody else's sin. But yet we're in a battle for our souls because in the end, folks, I want to suggest to you that you need to be ready for your eternal destiny. And that's coming soon if you want to observe what's happened today. And your plight for your journey to be with Jesus is to make sure that you understand the dichotomy of this battle between sin and righteousness. And verse 15, what then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law, but under grace? By no means. Don't you know that when you offer yourselves to someone as obedient slaves, by the way, the word slaves in the New, in the, in the New Testament, right, is dulo. And again, it means servanthood. It, that did not mean property and ownership. And murder and killing and lynching and hanging with a people group of hate. Oh, God, have mercy and forgive those who have perpetrated this evil against humanity. You are slaves to the one you obey. Whether you are slaves to sin, which leads to death, or to obedience, which leads to righteousness. Verse 17, but thanks be to God that though you used to be slaves to sin, you have come to obey from your heart the pattern of teaching that has now claimed your allegiance. Now verse 18, you have been set free. Are you hearing me? No longer slaves. You have been set free. And whom the Son of Man has set free, John says, is what? Is free indeed. Do you sense the freedom or are you still holding on to your man-made structure of what someone else is telling you? Do you know that you're free in your mind? Do you know that you're free in your spirit? Do you know that you're free in your color? Do you know that you're free? And God has given you equal opportunity in this present day for the future to rise above. Because last year, unlike the civil rights movement, where we only saw blacks fighting for the equality, what did we see last year? We saw brown. We saw white. We saw young. We saw old. We saw rich. We saw poor marching. 50 states in the U.S. declaring for what? For Black Lives Matter also. And that means that the unity of God's creation is understanding this plight for this freedom. But in our Christian walk today, it's beyond just Black Lives Matter. It's your spiritual life that matters, folks, when all is said and done. You can battle for all the cause you want in this world. But if you aren't battling for your soul, you're going to hell. And you've got to battle for your soul to walk in righteousness Accepting Christ as your Savior so you can walk in your eternal destination where color would not matter, where status would not matter. Some of you like to wear nice gold. I know we got the bling bling going on. I'm telling you right now, that's cheap stuff because in heaven, I'm going to be walking on gold. You've got an eternal promise and a future for all of us in this present day and in what God has planned for us. So the basic definition of a person who is enslaved is legal property of another, forced to obey them. In this case, because I want you to become slaves to righteousness, I want you to be a doulo. Look at your neighbor and say, I'm a doulo. <laughs> I'm a doulo. And that simply means that you are now property owned by God. 
God wants to own you today. He wants to own your mind, your body, your soul, your spirit. He wants to own your family. He wants to own your career. He wants to own your destination, your plans, your future. God wants to own you, and he wants to enslave you to his righteousness. That means you can walk in the favor of God wherever you go, wherever you stand, whomever you with. You've got the favor of God if you enslave yourself to the righteousness of God. And that's the future plan. I can't tell you systemic racism is going to be eradicated. It's beyond perhaps human solutions. It's irrelevant to the big picture, folks. For every man will, every knee will bow and every town will confess eventually that Jesus Christ came for all of humanity. But your plight today is much more important for your spiritual souls. I want to read with you one last passage to just show you the importance of what this means to all of us in this future plan. And we are working together, Pastor Roger and I, we have been battling through this black history clergy. For, for, you're going to hear about it pretty soon because we are now part of a new coalition of many others who's rising up to have a balanced voice and champion and challenge the status quo of economic divide, of political divide, of family misguided structures, of all the factors of law enforcement and the brutality that you see perpetrating us. And by the way, as a police chaplain, you can rest assured, I'm caught in the middle of both. And I challenge both. But I want to say to you, who are you blaming today? Are you blaming slavery? Are you blaming the white man? Are you blaming yourself? Because we got to look in the mirror and see if we are champions to the cause of Christ. And it's through him that we will have the victory. And him only. And we're going to battle through this season right now, challenging law enforcement addressing political leaders, standing strong in our community, but we're also going to take responsibility for our own actions. And I'm challenging you now. You raise healthy boys and girls. And you young men who's having kids with no responsibility, shame on you, because I'm a product of no dad in my life. And I could have been a statistic like everybody else, because where's our black fathers? And yet we're blaming everything else about Black Lives Matter. We're not looking in the mirror and seeing our own actions of responsibility to combat the stigma placed on us where a system is against us. And I want to challenge you to stand strong. And it's not just about education. It's about moral standing in your homes. It's about having some pride and dignity about who you are, spinning sperm wherever you go. No, that's not the plight of our race. And that wasn't God's plan either. Take responsibility for your own actions as well. And we will champion and challenge both sides to make sure that we're walking in the favor of God. Yes, we've had some sad past. Yes, we've seen some current present situations. But I want to suggest to you, we've got a bright future in God. And you've got a bright future in God if you turn completely to him in this opportunity to become enslaved to the righteousness of God. People are talking about the black community and the, the Asian community who's facing all the challenges now. And we see this divide between nations and, and all the hate. Myanmar is having their own challenges. I want to read with you Revelations 5. And I'm going to wrap it up and thank you for the opportunity. This is what it says. And one day I'm going to come back and share with you the perspective of this whole idea of what Daniel and the prophet of Jeremiah and others had declared in prophetic word. And Jesus and Matthew shows up. And then Revelation comes and shows us the unfolding of God's end time prophetic promise of he is to come. Maranatha, even so, come Lord Jesus. But verse, chapter 5, verse 1 says, then I saw, actually I'll jump all the way to verses, um, to verses 6, just to save some time here. Then I saw a lamb. Now you know who that lamb is. In my, king, in my Bible here, it's a capital L. Then I saw a lamb looking as if it had been slain, standing in the center of the throne, encircled by the four living creatures and the elders. He had seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, sent out into all the earth. He came and took the scroll, from the right hand of him who sat on the throne. Now, as you know, the previous passage will tell you that John, who was taken up into heaven, 
before the 24 elders and the four beasts and, and God, seeing a scroll in the hand, nobody was able to open the scroll. And John was almost crying and wondering who is going to open the scroll to unfold the prophetic word of God. This is a hint of what's my, what I will come and share with you. And it says, unfolding right here, don't weep, John the angel says. Look, the lion of the tribe of Judah, he has the power to break the seas. Oh, somebody shout amen. The root of David has triumphed in verses 5. He is able to open the scroll and its seven seals. This lamb in verses 6. Now we're going to read now from verses 8. And when he had taken it, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb. Each one had a harp. And they were holding golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song. Now here is the future hope for us, folks. I know systemic racism may be with us until we die. I know it may linger on even though we're rising above and we have many standing strong with us. I know we're talking about inclusivity and all these factors that are plaguing us today. And I know the reality is we will still be succumbed to some kind of racial discrimination because there is always comparisons of people in this world. But yet, look what the hope says for us here. You are, and they sang a new song, verse 9. You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals because you were slain and with your blood. Now, 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 now. If you remember Acts chapter 7 verse 26, the original King James word is blood of the nations. This Jesus shed this blood that God was going to create all nations from in his creative power. And it says right here, let's read on. It says, the blood you purchased men for God. His own blood was purchased for us. He purchased us with his blood. From every, now here it is. From every tribe, every language, every people, every nation. There is no exclusivity in the eyes of God for his creation. Look it down at the beauty of his outward expression in all the colors of this world. Oh, somebody say amen. Aren't you glad that though politicians and presidents and former kings might have succumbed us to the scum of the earth and dogs as a people group, aren't you glad your creator, the supreme being, the heavenly father, looked at you and said, you are special, I made you in my image, and you are a chosen generation, you are a peculiar people that will show forth the praises of God who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. And it says right here that every tribe, language, people, and nation, you have made them to be a kingdom, and priests to serve our God, and they will reign, hallelujah, somebody. They will reign, hallelujah, somebody. I don't care what your color is. I don't care how you might feel as a black man. You, a woman, you will reign one day with Jesus on this very same earth that has judged you for who you are on the outside. But God is going to make you a king and a priest on this earth in due time as you stay faithful to his cause. I have a dream, Martin Luther King says, but I want to encourage you, Kingdom Gate, Equipment Center, live the dream today because it's a reality today and your future looks bright if you remain enslaved to the righteousness of God. Bow your hearts in prayer. God of mercy and grace, we receive your word, and I pray a blessing upon this ministry now. Thank you for the opportunity, Lord, to share in this moment just some truths about what it means of the past, the present, and the future. But I pray, Lord, the reality as we live today to this ministry will be a blessing that they will be the beacons of hope and light in the midst of pandemics, both a virus and systemic racism. But may they know that they have already overcome because they are more than conquerors through Christ who strengthens them. We declare and we pray your blessing now. And I pray your promises will remain with them. Every tribe, language, people, and nation 
that they will know that they will be rulers of this earth with Jesus as we remain faithful and slaves to his righteousness. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, and God bless you.